your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 9. Paul has been writing to the church at Corinth, a messed up church, a divided church, a selfish church. We're going to do what we want to do our way, and they're a mess. And he has to straighten some things out. He was written reports, here's what this church is doing, sexual immorality, all kind of messed up stuff. So Paul's writing to them. And uh, now in, in chapter 9, he's going to talk about self-denial for the gospel's sake. Self-denial. You know, we got to give up a lot and live as a sacrifice for Jesus. But before we get started, I just want to say, whatever you came in here with, whatever concerns you had and worries and battles and struggles you had going on, realize now, Jesus is still Lord. He will be tomorrow. He's got authority over it. So just breathe in. I breathe out, everything's going to be okay. So let's clear our mind and let's learn, okay? <laughs> Hope that helped with some distraction. Get that out of here. It's going gonna, it's gonna to mess you up. So anyway, P Paul was writing in chapter 8 in the past chapter about exercising freedoms and rights. You see people on TV, they're marching for their freedom, that we demand our rights. Well, Paul said you lose your rights if it causes another person to stumble, believer or unbeliever. If it causes someone to stumble, you lose that even if it's a liberty. Now, I know people go, well, that, there's nothing wrong with that. The Bible doesn't say there's anything wrong with that particular thing. Well, it does cover it because if what you're doing hurts someone else, then that becomes a sin for you. And so it, it covers a broad spectrum of things. So you, you, you lose your freedoms and your rights if someone else with a weaker conscience, if it causes them to stumble, you should set aside that freedom. But there's people in Corinth that had much of the same attitude a lot of Americans have right now. I demand my rights. Me, 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 me. It's a very selfish way of thinking. And so they felt if they could discredit Paul's apostleship, you're not really an apostle. We don't have to listen to you. That's what they were trying to do. You're not an apostle. We don't have to hear you. And so Paul goes on to explain how he is an apostle. And that's how he starts off, off in uh, chapter 9, verse 1. So in 1 Corinthians 9 and 1, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Okay, Paul is using them. He's using them to make his point that they should take his calling seriously. They should listen to him. Um, he says, I am an impossible. <laughs> an impossible. It was impossible for me to be saved, but Jesus did it. Let me... Tongue slip. <laughs> I knew I was going to do that one day. I am an apostle. I'm free to do and go wherever and whatever I want to do. But I have set my liberties aside so that all of you can be my work in the Lord, is what he's saying. I'm sure Paul would like to go and done other things. I'll live by the beach. I'll take it easy. I'm saved now. I'll just chill out. No, he's, he's working for the people. They are now his work. So, He's also getting at the, the, the point, he's saying, the blessings that you've been getting from my preaching is the very proof that I am an apostle in Christ. So, you know, uh, I, I want to ask you, any of you, if you've been blessed by coming here, then that validates my calling. You know, I, I can tell you the validation of my calling that happened. There's amazing things happened to confirm it in Israel, but what about you? Are you blessed here? Well, okay, there you go. That's kind of what Paul's getting at. I can relate to this. I could have skipped being a pastor and gone after other things. But God called me like He did Paul to make you my work. So I really relate with what Paul's saying here. And people sometimes look at me and they try to determine a way to undermine my calling thinking, do I really have to listen to Ray? I don't like what he said. So I'm going to invent a reason why I don't have to listen to what he preached today. And they take it out on me, not realizing I'm quoting from God's Word. That's what the church is doing to Paul. I just say, are you blessed here? If so, then you become the seal, the proof of my calling. <laughs> okay? I think we can see what Paul's getting at. So again, last chapter, <clears throat> Paul wrote that you must sacrifice your liberties for the gospel. Yes, you have freedoms. I'm a freed man in Christ. I get it. But... Great ministry cannot happen without sacrifice. 
You cannot have a ministry without sacrifice, giving things up. I want to show you in Romans 12 and 1. It says, present your bodies as a living what? Do whatever I want? Sacrifice. A sacrifice, holy, which means set apart. You're not like everybody else. Acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That is your service in the kingdom work to God. That you live with sacrifice and holiness. You can't live for Jesus while demanding your rights. People that demand their rights go like this. People that praise go like this. Big difference. Open hand. Paul is saying... If giving up my rights brings you blessing, then that is validation of my calling and I'll do it. And then therefore you should not question my calling either. He is giving up his rights at the expense of building up those who are weaker. But there's always going to be those, you know it. There's always those who are going to look for faults in other people. They will look at you and try to find something wrong. And let me just go ahead and address that. If you're looking for something wrong, you will find it. I'm a sinner like anybody else, okay? And people, well, I'm, I don't know, Ray, I don't know. I can see that thing they're doing. They're looking at me. Yeah, you want to find something wrong, you'll find it. As a matter of fact, at the Tabernacle Experience yesterday, I was talking to some of the people that ran it, and they said, man, you brought a lot of people here. And I said, yeah, I'm a pastor of a church. They go, you're a pastor? And they went, they looked at me like, you can't be. <laughs> I know, I get it. It's like, you don't look like a pastor. I'm like, good, I'm stealthy. Anyway, so there's those that look for faults, and Paul is about to address even that. 1 Corinthians 9 and 3. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do also the other apostles? the brothers of the Lord, and Cephas, or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? So what did he mean? The church had helped other apostles with their living ex expenses. The church said, let's pay the apostles so they don't have to spend all their time working so they can dedicate all their time to the study of the word and prayer. That's what the churches did for the apostles here. And so um, this is biblical. Pay the Bible teachers is what it is. Let me show you. Let me back Paul up. 1 Timothy 5.17 Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Now, you can understand how awkward of a verse that is for me to say because I'm the teacher in this case right here. And it talks of double honor. I'm not saying this for me. Oh, y'all double honor me. You double your tithing today. I'm, that's not what I'm getting at. What I'm saying is the work they do is very important work. Paul is trying to stress it's important work. You paid the other apostles. You're not paying me. They're trying to deny his calling. Let's move on. I want to show you another thing. You know, as Tommy had said, we, we uh, keep Israel up front. We have a, a ministry called Blessing Israeli Believers. The believers in Israel, we make sure that they are taken care of. And here's the, the scripture based that, that is based on that. Romans 15, 27. It says, For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, the Jews, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. And so we have blessing Israeli believers. We help the Jews that believe in Israel because they're very persecuted against and they need help. They can't get jobs like the unbelieving Jews can get. We help them with their living. And so this is biblical. And Paul had the biblical right. He had the biblical entitlement to claim pay from the church. It's in there. Because he'd been working real hard for this church, but he refused to make a protest to demand it. You see, he didn't demand it from them. And so he's making the case, if they're going to question and nitpick his calling, first, are you blessed by it? And second, you're sending all these guys out and you're paying them, but he's about to make a point with it. Their ben he's making the case that he's doing all this work for their benefit, for their blessing, without pay. For free. And you still tried to examine me to disprove me as an apostle? Can you hear what he's saying? <laughs> Poor Paul. Paul is the John Wayne of apostles. Okay, that dude was tough. And he said it like it is. Okay, anyway. 
So the church covered the other apostles. So he asked, do I have no right to refrain from working? They don't work and you pay them for their ministry. Do I have no right to refrain from working like them? I bless y'all for nothing. I can imagine being the people hearing this going, oh, I better stop trying to nitpick Paul and listen, right? So the church covered the apostles. So do I have the right to refrain from working? You benefit from my work, but you won't help me. And you criticize my calling. Now, everybody knows that old saying, you reap what you sow. You've probably heard it a million times. But very few people know the context from where that comes from. And I want to show it to you in Galatians 6 and 6. It says, let him who is... Let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. That's where it came from. So whoever is taught the word is to support whoever teaches it to them. Or else they become a God mocker. That's what the Bible says, not Ray Jensen, okay? Again, this ain't easy for me to stand up here and say this, being the teacher today. But if, you're, if those who will not support the ministry work and the pastors and the teachers, they are God mockers right there in black and white. You did come in here hoping to learn new stuff, right? <laughs> I hope so. Here it is. Okay. But you have to take care of the teachers. That's what's happening to Paul right now. Paul has the right to claim material support from the church for his ministry work that they're not giving him. So he goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 9 and 7, Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock. You know, when soldiers go to war, the nation that sends them is responsible to pay for what they need to get the job done. The nation that sends that soldier out should set them up with the stuff they need to get the job done. I know some of y'all in here are military. You didn't go buy all your gear. They gave it to you. They trained you. And they set you up to win. If you want to win, give them what they need. Christians should cover their pastors and their teachers for doing the work of ministry, especially if they expect the fruits from their work should help them. But Paul is dealing with a selfish church. They're very divided. They attack each other. Uh, one guy early on in the book was having sexual relations with his, his father's wife. <laughs> and they were celebrating it. Go, dude, you're awesome. He says, you don't celebrate that. You mourn it. This is how bad they are, how messed up they are. So Paul's dealing with a selfish church, and he believes that the best way to show the Corinthian people what unselfishness looks like is to give up his pay even though he's entitled to get it. If I have to show you what unselfishness looks like, I'll do this for nothing if that's what it takes to crack through, is what Paul's getting at. He believes that's the best way to show them. This is called sacrifice. Paul is living a life of sacrifice for others. And that's what Jesus did for us, right? <laughs> he gave up a lot for us. Philippians 2 and 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. I have to come in here with the attitude that I am the worst sinner in the room. I know what I've done. I don't know everything you've done, but I know what I've done. I consider y'all better than me. And that's why I get up here. I have no place to be a pastor. I really don't. Except for the fact God and His sovereign will chose me to be one. That's it. But in sacrifice, in lowliness, put yourself below others. We got, here's, the, here's the ultimate example. Jesus went to the cross for us. He didn't have to. He didn't have to. The king died for the slave. Makes no sense if you think of it that way. He could have said, I'm the king here, you're not, you die for me. But he died for us. Unselfishly, Jesus lowered himself to die for us. And he had every right, he had every entitlement to not have to go through crucifixion. But he gave up those rights for the blessing of those who are weaker. 
which is us. You see the Jesus parallel Paul is trying to show the people in Corinth. It's the very point he's trying to make. So he also says, Who plants a vineyard but does not eat the fruit? Who tends a flock but does not drink the milk? In other words, you work with the expectation of getting something out of it. Y'all don't go to your job and clock in and do all the work you do for no paycheck with no expectation of anything or else you wouldn't go. You do work to get something, some kind of blessing for somebody or if not yourself. So what about Paul? What about Paul? Should he not get something for the work he's putting into the Corinthian church? Shouldn't he get something out of it? He should. He absolutely should. 1 Corinthians 9 and 8. Do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about, or does He say it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt. This is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, listen to this, nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Paul could have taken them up on this entitlement, but he said, we'd rather not because of the gospel. Wow, that's heavy. Imagine the people hearing this from Paul going, guys, we messed up. We need to get right. But he says, don't muzzle the ox as it treads out the grain. Let's see that muzzle picture. Okay, that's a muzzle, and that's not an ox. That's a dog. <laughs> but you get the point. What a muzzle does. Keeps the dog from biting somebody or, you know, keeps them from eating. In, in the ox's, oxen's case, it keeps the ox from eating. Now, oxen were allowed to eat some of the grain of the field where they worked. Uh, this was, it helped keep the ox full of energy. It kept the ox nourished and he could do more work. Let him have a little bit of it. He'll, we'll get more. We'll get more for everybody. Um, it's it's kind of like a modern way of saying, don't keep diesel away from the tractor. <laughs> keep the tractor fed, you'll get more work done. See, if you muzzle an ox, nobody gets any grain. So helping the pastor blesses the church. Don't muzzle the ox. Don't hinder the teacher. Help the teacher, and it helps the whole church, and everybody gets blessed all the way around. So don't muzzle the ox as it treads out the grain, he says. But what Paul said in verse 12, he said, Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but we endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. This was Paul. Who's the we? Paul and Barnabas. They, they worked together, and both of them were entitled to ministry pay. But they had not used this right. They believed the people would understand the concept of sacrifice better if they did not take up this right. Because in the state of mind they were in, if they demanded this right, that would probably send the Corinthians off, well, okay, you demand that, well, we still demand what we want. So they thought, hey, it's better we back up and not demand pay for them to get it. Then when they got in godly order, then they would say, hey, we need to give them what they're entitled to. And then it would come into good order. So, uh, you know, the concept of sacrifice works better when you understand muzzling. If they gave up their pay, it would help them see the gospel better. However, if you don't muzzle the ox, then everybody is a lot happier like this dog. That's a happy dog, and that's a muzzle. I found that. I thought it was funny. I wanted to share it with you. <laughs> Everybody's happier. Anyway, let's move on to 1 Corinthians 9, 13. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple, and those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. The priests were allowed, they were per permitted in the temple to get their food from offerings, offerings that were given. They were allowed to partake of that for their living. They were entitled, it was their right to partake of it. And so they did because all their time was spent on laboring and ministry work. That's all they did. Somebody had to do it. And it was up to the people and their offerings to help see to it that they got it. 
So those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. Pretty easy. Let's move on. Now, I want you to check this out. This gets cooler as it goes. 1 Corinthians 9.15 But I have used none of these things. See, here he is again. He's not putting his fist in the air and demand. I have not, but I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things that it should be done so to me. For it would be better for me to die than that anyone should make my boasting void. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have been entrusted with a stewardship. Paul said, I would rather starve to death than ruin your picture of the gospel. I'd rather starve to death and die than mess y'all up. Wow, that sacrifice, that's pretty good. Paul did not boast in money. Hello, America. Paul did not boast in money. He boasted in Jesus Christ. You know, when I told people I was going to Bible college, they go, what can you do with that? <laughs> I know what they were thinking. How do you make money out of that? I said, you don't. Well, how are you supposed to? And then they'd stop. <laughs> how are you supposed to? And I knew what they meant. I said, I'll let God take care of that. I have Jesus. I got him. I was boasting in Christ. And Paul was boasting in Christ. He didn't boast in money. I want you to look at verse 16, though, how he says, If I preach the gospel, I don't boast because necessity is laid upon me. What does this mean? Necessity is laid upon me. Paul did not come into his calling willingly. Paul did not, oh yeah, sounds good, let's do it. He didn't do that. Um, like other guys did. Paul was more like Jonah. You remember Jonah? God called Jonah. Jonah said, no, uh-uh, no, no, sir. What did God do? Oh, he made it hard. He made it rough on Jonah to get called into his ministry. When I first got called into ministry, I didn't want to do it either. I really didn't. I was scared of it. I'm going to mess it up. I'm, I'm so messed up, I'll mess it up. And uh, I didn't kind of have the picture down, right? I didn't want to do it. I ran from it. And God just like, okay, you'll, you're going to find out <laughs> what this running from me stuff does. And he finally got me. Oh, yeah, I was saved and everything. But the ministry calling, it was another deal. I had my big career and my job going, all that stuff. I thought, I, I'm, I'm comfy here. You know, if I went into ministry, I'd have to leave all that. God goes, I'll take care of that. I'll take care of that. No, God, I don't really think you can do it. I didn't say that, but I was thinking, I don't, God, I don't really think you can do it. So he made it hard. He made it rough. And it finally come down. Paul, likewise, he had it slammed on his head to do it. Necessity is laid upon me, is what he's getting at. Uh, you remember, Paul was a Christian killer. That's what he did. He murdered Christians. His calling uh, by God was a, hard, it was a hard event to go through. It was tough. It was very difficult. It was not the, the sunbeam from the cloud with choir singing, Oh, come to me, Paul. Yes, that's not the way it always goes. Some guys hear this calling, they're like, not me. Moses said, not me. Pick somebody else. And so Paul says, if I don't preach, if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of because I'm in big, big trouble if I don't. He understood the harshness of the calling. If I don't do this, God's going to get me. And I don't want that to happen. <laughs> it's one reason why I'm up here. God told me to do it. You better do it. He's not preaching like it's just voluntary. He, Paul is preaching like it's necessary. Why don't we do that? Why don't we proclaim the gospel like it's necessary? People are dying out there. They don't have Messiah, Jesus. They don't have Him as the Savior in their life. They just think He's some historical guy. Yeah, I know He died on the cross. I, you know, you know, they, they, I know, so I'm okay. No, preach it like it's necessary. Laid upon you. If I have nothing to, I have nothing to boast of, but I'm in big trouble if I don't do it. It's necessary. I preach the gospel, for necessary is laid upon me, he says. Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. Paul, his calling is real. His calling by God is absolutely authentic. And he's trying to, con to, to prove to the people of Corinth, this is the real deal. You ought to listen to what I'm trying to say. They should listen, and they should stop trying to find a fault with him. 1 Corinthians 9.18 
What is my reward then? That when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge, that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. So it's, hey guys, I'm doing all this work absolutely free, without charge. I'm doing it for free. So what's my reward then? So what do I get out of it? His answer is so that he won't abuse the authority that the gospel gives him. Have you ever seen somebody abuse their authority? In the workplace, whatever. What did that do to you? Make you resent them? You sure didn't want to listen to them? Man, that guy, he just... Yeah, I've been there. Paul didn't want to become that. He did not want to abuse his authority. He wanted the people to follow him. He wanted the people to love him. He wanted the people to listen to him. So he could not abuse his authority or they weren't going to have it. So he says, I give up my rights for your benefit. And you question my calling. Are you blessed? Are you getting something out of my work? Why do you question my calling then? I'm doing this for nothing because it's better for you. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as without law. Not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ. That I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Paul made himself as a Jew or a Gentile, whoever he needed to be, he became that for them, to win them. That's what he's doing. He set his liberties aside to become all things to all men that he might gain them. Let me give you an example. I know believing Jews in Israel that won't eat pork. It's okay to eat pork. It's okay. Jesus declared all foods clean. But why do they not eat pork? Because they live among other Jews who operate as though they're still under the law, not the grace of God. Oh, we're still under law. So they, have, they still go by these strict dietary things and they won't eat pork. So if you're a believing Jew... And you sit down in front of another Jew who's still operating in law, in, under the law, and you're chowing down on pork, he's going to look at you and go, <laughs> he's offended, and he won't listen to you. Okay? So what these believing Jews do is they become, as a Jew, like those under the law. They won't eat pork because they don't want to ruin their opportunity to speak to them to where they won't hear. They want to keep their ears open so that they can share the gospel with them. Because they will ask... Do you eat kosher? And the Jews over there will say, yes, we do. And they'll go, okay, good. Relationships are better from the get-go. If they said, do you eat kosher? No, no, man, I eat pork and you know, oysters and all that kind of stuff. I love that stuff. Then they'll go, okay, good for you. And then they don't want to hear it. They, they have the liberty to eat pork, but they set those liberties aside for the weaker conscience of the person's for that person's blessing. So that's an example of what Paul's getting at. He became a Jew for the Jews. He became a Gentile for the Gentiles, for those who are weaker, so that he might win some. And again, I use, uh, for me personally, if you drink alcohol, I'm not coming down on you. I'm talking about me. This is my choice, Ray Jensen. I'm talking about me. I use the picture of alcohol. I have chosen not to drink it because I don't want to ruin my chances of reaching someone who is weaker in their conscience about alcohol than me. That's why I won't drink it. I'm not, I'm not debating the, is it okay to drink or not? Jesus turned the water to wine. People always do that thing that misses the whole point. But anyway, I do this. I set that liberty aside for the gospel's sake. That's why I do it. You will never see me drink alcohol. For one, I had a problem with it at one time in my life. I ain't touching that stuff no more. But if I do it, what's it going to do to some of you? I don't know what your past is. I don't know if some of you have a difficulty with alcohol somewhere in your past. In, in your past. I don't know. I don't want to be a problem to that. So I won't touch it. You see what Paul's getting at. I'm going to become all things for all people so that I might win some. That's what Paul's getting at. And I do this for the gospel's sake, 
Not my sake. I do this for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of the gospel with them. Every time somebody comes to belief in Jesus Christ, I experience their joy with them. That's how I'm a partaker. Their blessings they bring into the body of Christ. It comes back to me because they're in here and it, I'm a partaker of the gospel with them. Isn't it great? Pretty easy. 1 Corinthians 9.24 do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection lest when I have preached to others, I have myself should become disqualified. Now, anybody got trophies at home that you won? I've got a trophy I won in 1980, none of your business, that <laughs> long time ago in basketball, we were second place. There were three other teams that made second place. I don't understand that, but anyway, second place. And, <laughs> and it's old. It's an old trophy. It's been lost for a number of years. Part of it broke. It's dusty. It's perishable. It's going to go away. That's, that's a perishable crown. But we strive for an imperishable crown, a crown that's never going to fade. Everything you do in service work to the, to the Lord as a, as a believer becomes an un, imperishable crown. It's eternal. Isn't that cool? And you know, if I was excited about a little trophy, imagine the things God can give. Golly, that's going to be good. But we're running for a perishable crown. But Paul is explaining his ministry did not come easy. It took training. And he starts talking about athletes to give us a picture of this. Now, let me ask you a question. Does an athlete have the liberty to eat cake and ice cream every night? Sure he can, if he wants to. But he's not going to win. <laughs> Mr. Olympia, those guys are cut, man. They're lean. Can they pig out? No. Theoretically, yes, they can, but they're not going to win. Paul said, run like you're trying to win. That's what he's saying. Your liberties, oh, I can do this and I can do this. But wait a minute. Am I doing anything productive? You set these things aside. Run like you're trying to win. Put your body into subjection so that you can be fit. Don't just... Be a Christian to be chill about it. Be in it to win it. You know people that are lost. What are you doing? Are you helping them? Are you, telling, are you trying to show Jesus in some kind of way through how you live? Or are you, no, my right's my way. I can do what I want to. Are you helping them? You're going to have to give up some liberties to do it. I don't want to give that liberty up. Okay. Are you more concerned about yourself or them? Hear what Paul's saying? You know, um, Joy, I think, uh, I think Paul trained at Israeli self-defense because he talks about boxing here. Uh, he, he says, I fight not as one who beats the air. I'm glad John wasn't here to see this because my stance is all wrong, okay? Not as one who beats the air. I was at Israeli self-defense one time, and all these people were fighting each other. I don't, they were testing for a belt, and I don't know exactly what they were doing, but they were fighting each other. And they were going at it. And this one dude, he either got punched or kicked. I missed it, but I heard it. He got bonked right square in the nose. Oh, I heard him do that. And he, he stumbled off the side. John comes running up and he checks him out. John's like, he checks him real quick. He goes, you're all right, get back in there. And I'm like, dude, man, this guy just got popped. And John sent him right back in, get back in. What if the guy said, no, y'all keep fighting. I'm going to stand over here by myself and I'm going to box the air. What? <laughs> What does that do? You're not going to win a black belt. It doesn't do anything. Friends, this is how we're to take the gospel to the world. Don't get in there halfway. Get in strong and be confident about it. See what he says in verse 26. He says, therefore I run not with uncertainty. I'm going to win, guys. That's his attitude. Oh, I don't know. Other people are better than me. Oh, Ray, other pastors talk better than you do. Oh, Ray, other pastors look better than you do. Oh, Ray, other pastors have bigger churches and more funds and more. Uh-uh. Run with certainty. Be sure about it. You hear what he's getting at? Be confident. Therefore, I run not with uncertainty. You know, the gospel is a sure thing. It is a sure thing. It is a good thing to, to, 
to put your chips in. So the thing is, though, are you denying yourself a lot of the liberties you could be entitled to? But the thing is, does it help the weaker to see Jesus? Run in such a way. Live in such a way that you're not just here existing and taking up room. I'm here to make money, live in a comfortable, I just want to be comfortable. Are you here to win, to win souls for Jesus? We need to get out there and do it, put the do it to it, is what I say. Let's put the do it to it. Let's get out there and do it. Your rights and your entitlements are secondary to the gospel of Christ, to the weaker people who are not saved. If you're saved, you got your salvation. What about theirs? Don't walk around with my rights. You're saved. Show them Jesus Christ and help them to see the Savior. If it takes giving up everything you have for them to be saved. Hello, Jesus did that. He gave up his life. If it takes giving up everything you have for others to see Jesus, are you willing to do it? That was a question I was confronted with when God called me out of that great job I had. I had title, I had position, I had authority, I had benefits, I had all kind of good things going. And God told me, walk away from it. I'm not boasting, I'm just giving you a picture. But God, look at all the stuff I leave behind. He goes, yeah. But he also said, who says you get to keep it if you stay? Oh my gosh, I better take him up on it. So I left and here I am. Our rights and entitlements are secondary to the gospel of Christ. If it takes giving up what I'm entitled to for you to get blessed, for you to get saved, I'll do it. Because I'm a partaker with you. That's my reward. That's my reward. Your reward is my reward. Isn't that good?